Well, he enlisted in the army as a young man, eager to see the world, eager, quite honestly, to see a little battle. And if he's really being honest, partially enticed by the upward mobility that military service could provide a man from his kind of family. And so he did a few tours. He served his time, saw the world. And after 10 years of serving faithfully and having the scars to prove it, he was finally promoted to the position of centurion put in charge of uh, nearly 100 men. He came with some additional responsibility, came with a raise in pay, but unfortunately it also came with a transfer of location really to an undesirable assignment, Judea, the armpit of the empire. And while him and his troops would normally stay at the beautiful fortress in Caesarea, during the feast days, during the holidays, they were brought into the capital city of Jerusalem as extra muscle for crowd control. And a good thing, too. Because it seemed like with each passing year, the temperature in Jerusalem continued to rise and rise and rise, as if the whole city were waiting on the edge of its seat, just waiting for some event to push things over into a boiling point and for riots and insurrections to burst out. This year's disturbance was caused by a popular preacher from Galilee. And the crowds had had swarmed and swelled on Sunday as he had arrived in town. They gathered at the city gates and they shouted their political slogans. Hail, blessed, here comes the king, God's true king to bring peace, to bring glory. The thing they're forgetting is they already have a king. And And he already has a king. And that's who this guy works for. And to a Roman, those sound like fighting words. So no wonder the governor put his troops on standby. They were ready at a moment's notice to put down any kind of would-be uprising. But interestingly enough, things dissipated after a few hours and the rest of the week was relatively quiet. And then, seemed like, out of the blue, Friday morning, all of a sudden the man was brought in shackles before the governor. And a trial began. And the captain sat there and watched as accusations were thrown and an angry mob gathered and before long they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And he has to be honest, as an outsider to the whole process, he's not entirely sure what this man is supposed to be accused of, but he's not really much for politics. Clearly someone has headed out for this guy and decided it's time for him to go. He doesn't ask questions. He's a good soldier. He knows how to carry out orders. And so when the command comes, he stands by and watches as his men beat this man to a pulp. And they smash a crown of thorns on his head and they spit on him and they mock him. And then they lead him out to be executed. Now in his time, he's walked with plenty, a condemned man on the way to his death. He's heard everything. He's seen everything. And yet, This particular Friday stands out to him as he watches the composure of this man, Jesus. He doesn't beg. He doesn't scream. He doesn't struggle. He speaks only a handful of times. But the words he said on that fateful Friday will be etched in his memory forever. And we want to follow along with the centurion on the road to the cross this evening. So if you have a Bible, you can turn in your Bibles or turn on your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. We are continuing in a series that we started last weekend with a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Talked about the road into Jerusalem. Today we are talking about the road to the cross and we continue tomorrow and Sunday talking about the road to Emmaus as we celebrate Easter Where we last left our hero, Jesus, last week he was entering into Jerusalem. He spends Monday through Wednesday in the temple courts teaching. Thursday night he celebrates the Passover with his disciples where he institutes the Lord's Supper, which we've just celebrated. And then late in the evening, in the night on Thursday, he's arrested and he stands trial in secret trials overnight. Finally, he's condemned on Friday to be crucified. And so we're going to pick up the story as Jesus makes his way on the road to the cross. And as we do that, as we follow along, as Luke recounts what happened that day, we're going to see three uh, aspects of Jesus' heart that are revealed on his way to the cross. The heart of Jesus revealed these three different ways. So the first way that we see Jesus' heart revealed on his way to the cross is we see Jesus' heart for those who misunderstood him. 
We see Jesus' heart for those who misunderstood him. Follow along with me as I read Luke chapter 23, beginning of verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and they put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nurse. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? What well, would have been customary in the Roman uh, culture, Greco-Roman society, for when someone was executed for them to carry their own cross. And so typically that was a big, heavy, wooden cross beam that would later be connected to a supporting beam. And that would be normal for a criminal to walk to the place where they'd be executed. And yet we see that Jesus doesn't carry his cross beam. Another man, Simon, is conscripted to carry his cross, which reminds us of how badly Jesus was beaten. He was too weak to carry his own cross. Simon takes up his position following after Jesus, picking up his cross and following Jesus. Sounds like something Jesus taught his disciples. If anyone wants to follow me, they need to pick up their cross and follow me. We also see other people following along after Jesus, but they're in a slightly different category. They're a crowd. They're watching. They're wailing. And these are ladies. These are women who are crying out and mourning and wailing. Now, we have every reason to think that these women are sincere, that they genuinely love Jesus. They are weeping because they had seen his teaching. They had seen his miracles. They had begun to hope that he was the Messiah, that he was the king, come to change everything. And they're weeping because they think they're watching the death of their hopes and their dreams because they know what Jesus is about to face. And yet here we see Jesus' heart. In the hour of his suffering, in more pain than most of us will ever experience, his concern is not for himself, but his concern is for them. He turns to them and says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and weep for your children. And then he quotes these words that are really kind of hard for us to understand um, because we need to, we need to understand what kind of theme he's tapping into. He's speaking a compassionate word of warning. He says, don't worry about me. You should worry about your families. Why? Why is he saying that? Well, he's tapping into this theme that happens all throughout the Old Testament where God warns his people what the consequence is for disobeying him. If you decide to go your own way and rebel against God, there are consequences. And often in the Old Testament for God's people, rebelling against God means that he's going to send armies against them and conquer them. That's normally the consequences of the curses of the covenant for disobeying God. And that was always designed to be uh, a sample of a, a bigger, more final kind of judgment, the, the final judgment, or we might say an, an eschatological judgment, an end times judgment. It was always meant to be a sample of that, the horror and the, and, the, and the terror of war and of being conquered and in battle like that was meant to remind people, man, this is serious. Disobeying God has a serious, serious price. Uh, think about it this way. Those of us who have small children, you know that when your kids are little, maybe like my kids, uh, you had this experience where you tell them, uh, don't touch, you know, the hot stove. Like, that's a bad thing. We don't want you to get hurt, okay? So you warn them, you say, don't touch the stove, and that's a rule in your house. And then what happens? They look at you, and they reach out, and they touch the stove. So what do you do? I mean, call me a bad parent if you don't agree with this, but like, I grab that hand, and I go like, hey, don't touch the stove. Ow! You know, they're like, ow, what is that, right? Now, what am I doing in that moment? Uh, now, getting, getting this t your hand touching the stove does not automatically kind of like earn you a smack on the hand. What am I doing? I'm trying to get them to associate touching something hot with pain. Because I'm trying to spare them. I'm trying to like show them that like disobeying me can lead to bad things. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to protect you here, okay? So the smack on the wrist is really a, a warning. It's a sample of a much worse thing that could happen to them. So too with the conquering that Jesus is warning the people of. He's saying, hey, you're, you're, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves because you are headed in a bad direction. You need to repent. You need to turn or you will be conquered. And Rome is going to do that. They're going to come in in AD 70 and they're going to burn Jerusalem to the ground and destroy the temple. And many of the people that were here this weekend to celebrate you know, Passover and all that, they'll be killed. They'll be slaughtered by the Romans. 
Why, why do they need to repent? What do they need to repent from or turn from? Well, Jesus tells us in, in Luke chapter 19, we actually looked at it last weekend. He stands outside Jerusalem before he enters in and he cries and he weeps and he says, oh, Jerusalem, if only you had known, if only you had turned, but you've missed, you've missed the time of God's visitation. He's saying, you missed me. Like You claim to worship God, but I am him and you missed me. I'm the king you've been waiting for. But they rejected him. They misunderstood. They had their own ideas about about God and his purposes and what the Messiah would do. And so they missed Jesus, the very one that they were waiting for. And he says to these women, if you continue to miss me, if you continue to reject me as God's Messiah, you will not only face the temporary judgment of a Roman army, but you will face the ultimate judgment that it points to. Now, I remember when I was in uh, grad school, when I was in seminary, uh, one of my first classes I took was like some uh, class that I was very excited about. I was getting a good grade in it. I was, I was learning a ton, and I was kind of nervous going into the final exam as a professor I really liked. And there were really only two questions in this final exam, and they were writing, so you had to just write a ton. And so I went in there feeling very confident. I like whipped off the first section, looked at the second section, got it, wrote something out, and like left within, I don't know, probably a half an hour. We had probably two hours to take this test. I was feeling so confident and so good. And then I get my test back, you know, later that week, and uh, I basically have the entire back section of this test marked off, like fail, okay? And I got a terrible grade. It kind of hurt my grade for the rest of my time there. And I was like, what? What is going on? And then I went back, and I read the instructions <laughs> for that second part. That's key. That's key. And I had totally misunderstood what the, what the question was asking. I had basically uh, answered it incorrectly, And so what would have happened, I knew what would have happened if I would have gone to my professor's door. Excuse me, Dr. Carson, uh, do you mind if I, uh, I, uh, there's been a misunderstanding. I, uh, I just didn't understand, you know, what we, were, <laughs> what we were supposed to write. I knew this professor uh, was not a soft man. He was not a compassionate man. He, he would have said, um, well, you had the same instructions everyone else did, so you get what you deserve. <laughs> Sorry you misunderstood, but that's what you, that's what you get. Jesus is not like that. He's more compassionate than that guy. <laughs> he's, he's warning. He's warning these women. He sees that they've misunderstood who he is, and he's saying, go back, read the instructions, take, take stock of who I am, recognize what's going wrong, repent, turn from your sin, and trust in me, repent and turn, and there can be healing, there can be rescue. He's warning them because he deeply cares about people who have missed him. Maybe you know people like that in your life who have misunderstood Jesus. Maybe that's you. You're like, I don't, I don't really know if I understand who Jesus is. Jesus loves you deeply. He loves people who misunderstand him. There's a warning here. And what's amazing, what's amazing is that though Jesus is innocent, he is taking upon himself the judgment that the city and the nation deserves. He's taking upon himself the judgment that you and I deserve for sin. And though he knows what he's about to face, his heart is for those who have not yet truly turned to him. What an incredible savior. The road to the cross reveals Jesus' heart for those who misunderstood him. Secondly, we see Jesus' heart for his enemies. We see Jesus' heart for his enemies in verses 32 to 38. Follow along with me as I read. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him, and they said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up, and they mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar, and they said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. Luke tells us that the men who are crucified next to him are criminals. It's not the word that Matthew and Mark use for criminals like bandits or robbers. It just is a general word for lawbreakers. So it's not so much emphasizing what these men did, but in contrast to Jesus, Jesus has done no wrong. These men are genuinely criminals. They have broken the law. They are getting what they deserve. And they bring 
the soldiers bring Jesus to the place called the skull, which in Aramaic is called uh, Golgotha. Here it's just the word for skull in Greek, and they crucified him. Now, many of us have seen movies or depictions graphically depicting or describing the crucifixion. And what you'll notice if you've seen those things that in the gospel accounts, there's very little description. You simply get the word and then they crucified him. And that's because everybody in the first century knew exactly what crucifixion was. And it would have sent chills down their spine. There was even a a Roman writer named Cicero who wrote and said that it was inappropriate and rude for Romans to even use the word cross in public out loud. So shameful, so horrible was the practice of crucifixion. On top of the immense pain of having nails driven in through the wrists and the ankles, Jesus was likely crucified naked, hanging there in front of everyone for public shame. And adding to that, they add mockery. They call out, he saved others, let him save himself. What do they mean by that? What do they mean? They don't actually think he can save himself. They're making fun of him. They're saying, he saved others. Yeah, but he can't save himself. And as one of my professors once said, he said, but we know, and Luke knows, and God knows, that in order to save others, he must not save himself that he's on the cross not saving himself in order to save others. But we see Jesus' heart in verse 34. It says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Now, in Greek, there are two past tenses. Some of you took Spanish, so you know the imperfect and the preterite. Same thing in Greek. There are two different past tenses. One is an action that just sort of happens and stops. One is an ongoing, continual action. And though most of the narrative is in that, uh, the kind of stops, it's just a single action. This word, he said, is actually in the ongoing. It's in the imperfect. And so it might be a good translation or bringing out the sense of what's going on here to translate it that Jesus was saying or Jesus continued saying, describing this was something that Jesus was saying as he was being crucified. So we could imagine him as they lay him on the wood saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And as they drove the nails through his wrists, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And as they hoisted him up onto the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I don't know about you, but I've noticed that there's an increasing... Uh, frustration, I'll call it, in our culture with people who are uh, hypocrites who say uh, one thing, impose certain rules on uh, us so, and, then, and then don't follow those rules themselves or they do, they say one thing and they, and they do something else. We saw this during, for instance, uh, COVID where certain you know, governors or politicians would impose restrictions on everyone and then be caught not following those restrictions themselves or we know people who are, you know, say that they're really all about moral integrity and not lying and then, oops, turns out they're kind of a bit of a liar themselves or kind of a bit of a a hypocrite or I've known people who, you know, say they care deeply about the poor or, um, you know, immigrants and those sorts of things. But if you actually look at their lives, they're not really doing anything to help in those ways. Yet, I've always been impressed by people who put their money where their mouth is. I have known people who say, yes, we should care about the poor and they've invited people into their homes to stay with them. They've donated significant amounts of their money to help people in need. And I think, yes, that's right. They put their money where their mouth is. They're a person of integrity. Now you need to remember that Jesus walked around for three years and said things like, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, for you'll be blessed. Great is your reward in heaven. And I'm sure there were people listening, hearing him say those things that thought, Sure, great, sounds good, yeah. Let's see, let's see how you really feel when the rubber hits the road. When you're actually pressed, do you actually live up to your own standards, Jesus? And here we see, yes, Jesus keeps his word. His heart is for his enemies. As he's being crucified, as he's being killed by his enemies, he is praying for them, saying, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. In the moment when he could, with one word, have called down thousands of angels to destroy his enemies. He uses his words to pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Why? Because he loves them. Because he loves 
his enemies. He genuinely wants what is best for them. He looks at those who have their arms crossed in defiance or disobedience, those who are in outright rebellion against him, and he genuinely loves them. Friends, Jesus did not go to the cross for good people. He went to the cross for his enemies. Amen? Amen. And thank God, because that is what we were before we came to Jesus, that we were enemies, hostile towards God in our minds, alienated from him estranged from him until we were given the grace and the forgiveness that comes only through Jesus. Thank God the road to the cross reveals Jesus' heart for his enemies. And finally, we see the road to the cross reveals Jesus' heart for sinners to be reconciled to the Father. We see Jesus' heart for sinners to be reconciled to the Father. Follow along with me in verses 39 to 49. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And it was about noon, And darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. And the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and they went away. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. At this point in the crucifixion, one of the criminals that's been crucified alongside Jesus joins in the mockery of the crowd. And it's not clear what benefit this could have for him. He's making fun of the guy who's being crucified next to him. Hey, if you say you're the Messiah, save, save us too. You know, save yourself and save us. I think at this point, it's just an act of angry desperation directed towards Jesus. He's just joining in in the accusations. But the other criminal recognizes that Jesus is innocent. And he turns to Jesus with one final plea. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, well, hold on now. Uh, there's a few things you got to do first. Uh, you got to, well, you got to um, pray a certain prayer and uh, you got to start reading your Bible. That's key. And um, you got to join, you know, join a Bible study, maybe become a church member, start giving to the church. That would be good as well. No. What does Jesus say? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus, who can peer into hearts sees this man, in him, a genuine response of desperate faith. This man has come to the end of himself. He somehow realizes that Jesus is God's true king and knows that a pardon from Jesus is his only hope. And that pardon is granted. And it seems like, well, that's not fair. <laughs> like, oh, he got to go through his whole life kind of doing his own thing and he kind of just like gets a get out of jail free card at the, at the end. That's not fair. How can Jesus do that? How can God do that? That's not fair. And the reason he can do that is because what comes next in the story. It's what Jesus' death is about to accomplish. We see that everything goes dark It's noon and darkness covers over the land. And that literal darkness, I believe it was literally dark there, points to a spiritual darkness that is going on. Satan and the powers, the demonic powers of this world thought that they had won. They thought they had defeated Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus takes upon himself all the sin, all the evil of the world. He takes upon himself God's righteous judgment for sin. Paul will say it like this, him who, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In that moment, Jesus takes that upon himself and we see the result. The curtain of the temple is torn in two. The temple 
God had manifested his presence there in the Holy of Holies in this special place that only the high priest could go only once a year. Now the temple curtain is torn in two, symbolizing that access to God's presence, access to a relationship with God is open to all because of Jesus' death, because of what his death accomplished on the cross. That's why he can say to the man, today you'll be with me in paradise. I forgive you. I'm paying for your sins as we speak. And having accomplished the mission for which he was sent, Jesus cries out to the Father, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. This was Jesus' heart in life and in ministry, especially in his death, making a way for those far from God to be brought into his kingdom. This is Jesus' heart. His heart is to see sinners reconciled to the Father. Now, I've noticed in my own life that as I've gotten older, and especially as I've had kids, I've become a little bit more and more of a softie. Anybody else in that boat? A little bit of a softie? Anybody else here cry at movies? Commercials? Yes, okay, some of us, yeah, okay. Now, I was thinking about this, you know, this, this idea of Jesus reconciling sinners to the Father, and I was looking for movies um, that kind of captured this idea, and I started uh, gravitating towards the movie Brave. Anybody see the movie Brave? It's a, a Disney movie about a Scottish princess, all right? And Yeah, that's good. And, um, and Merida and her mom, uh, you know, are fighting, and they're like, they're at war with each other, and because of some mean, nasty things that Merida says to her mom, and her mom says to her, their relationship is fractured. There's a tapestry that symbolizes their relationship. It's torn in two, and so the two of them are, you know, alienated from one another. And there, you know, there's the usual hijinks of spells and, you know, adventure to try and solve this problem, and the problem of their relationship doesn't get solved until finally, at the end, Merida looks at her mom, and she says, Mom, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's my fault. I did this. And she repents. It's probably the only time in a Disney movie somebody repents, you know? <laughs> she like repents. She says, I'm sorry. And I'm watching this on my YouTube and I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. oh Merida, I love you too. You know, like, like my, heart, my heart is just melting just to see this beautiful like mother and daughter come back in a relationship with one another. Their relationship had been fractured and they're brought back and my heart is like welling up and crying. Oh, yes, yes. It just feels right. It feels so right. And I think if that's how I feel, you know, about a stupid cartoon, <laughs> how much more? does Jesus rejoice when those who have been far from God run back to him and God receives them with open arms and says, come here. The prodigal son, some of us know that story, the picture of the father running to the one who's been far off and embracing them. Jesus' heart is to see sinners reconciled to the father and that's what we see on the road to the cross. His heart is on display even as he goes to the cross and dies for our sins. Now we see Jesus' heart in this story and I want you to know that Jesus' heart in this true account is also his heart today. That Jesus still cares so deeply for those who are far from him. He cares deeply for those who misunderstand him, even for those who are his enemies. And so I need to say to you in a room this size, I have to imagine there are some of us here who are still not sure where we stand with Jesus. Maybe you got dragged here because your parents said it's time to go to church, it's, it's Good Friday, and you're still trying to figure out, do you really believe this stuff or not? And the question before you is, what do you do with Jesus? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? Or will you disregard him? It's an either or choice. But I need you to know that Jesus loves you. He loves you deeply. And no matter what you've done, no matter how much of your life you've lived with your arms pushing back against him, or your back turned toward him and saying, I just don't really care right now, Jesus is waiting, waiting for you to come to him, to turn, to repent, to say, I'm sorry. It's my fault. I'm sorry for what I've done. I turn to you. Would you forgive me? Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me Come into my heart, give me the Holy Spirit, transform me from the inside out. I promise you, if you do that, it will change your life now and for forever. Because like the thief on the cross, what awaits you when you leave this world is paradise. It's eternal life. It's eternal life. That's why we're here. 
So if you have never done that, you could have a chance to call out to Jesus tonight, to pray, to say you're sorry, to call out to him and begin a relationship with him. I know many of us in the room already know Jesus, and this is an annual reminder of what Jesus has done for us. That if we've given our lives to him, we have experienced the heart of our savior, Jesus. Before his saving work in our lives, we were those who misunderstood him. We were those who were enemies. We were sinners needing to be reconciled, brought back into relationship with him. And on this Good Friday, we remember the price that he paid for our sin. Which is why tonight, after we respond in song, I want to ask you to leave this room in quiet. Some of us grew up in church traditions where that was part of Good Friday service, so you're familiar with that. But if you're not, that's what we're gonna ask is just to, as the service winds down, for you to just pause for a moment. If you need to linger and talk to God about something, you can do that. But then when you're ready, just feel free to leave quietly, recognizing the soberness, the somberness of this night. And then if you come back tomorrow or you come back Sunday, we're gonna have a party. We're gonna celebrate. But tonight we remember what Jesus paid for us. We remember that on this Good Friday, that it was there that Jesus paid it all, that we owe it all to him, that sin had left a crimson stain, and yet he washed it white as snow. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, if there's any here tonight who don't yet know you, I pray right now you are tugging on their hearts. You're showing them how desperately they need you, that you are the answer to the questions they've been asking, that you are the peace that they've been looking for, that you are the healing for the shame or the guilt in their lives. I pray that they turn turn their lives over to you. Confess you as their Lord and Savior, Jesus, and know eternal life. Lord, for those of us who know you, would you deepen our gratitude for what you accomplished on Good Friday? Would you fill our hearts with thankfulness and send us out from this place to share with those who desperately need you? We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said,